So now you've gone through the hardest day of the retreat. From here on out it gets much easier, I promise. The more that you smile, and I mean all the time, smile, when you're, when you're taking a shower, when you're eating, when you're going for a walk, smile. And this will improve your mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How your attention goes from being on your object of meditation to thinking about something else. When your mindfulness is good, you won't get caught for near as long with the chatter and uh, the wandering mind. There's a lot of studies that are going on on smiling right now. And they're all saying basically the same thing. See, if, if you have a little smile on your lips, and I don't mean a big toothy grin, just a little smile, and a smile in your mind, your mind has the idea that it's happy, and it becomes happy. The sharper your mindfulness becomes, the faster your progress in the meditation becomes. Now this is, this is for real. So I want you to smile. I don't care what you're doing. Whether you're washing your hands or going to the toilet or taking a shower, smile all the time. you'll see the advantages of this very quickly. Now, what happened today was because this, you're, you're only a day out from being in the world. What happens now, or what happens today is your mind keeps wanting to do that. Go out and think about this and that and wonder about this and that and you're not able to stay on your object of meditation for very long. That will change as you smile more. And you have a lot of hindrances that arise that mean uh, take your mind away from your object of meditation, take your mind away from the loving kindness. Why do you have hindrances arise? Now that's a question that doesn't get asked very often. What is a hindrance? What's the cause of the hindrance? The cause of the hindrance is in the past you broke precepts. You know what the five precepts are? Uh, lust, hatred, sloth and torpor, restlessness, and doubt. Whenever these things come up into your mind, they're going to stop you from meditating. You're not going to be on your object of meditation at all. And you're going to get caught up in your thoughts and desires and all kinds of problems. Now, in the morning, I ha I'm having you recite the precepts every morning, not as a rite and ritual, but do it with awareness. Do it with paying attention that you don't want to break these precepts. Because as soon as your mindfulness gets weak, a hindrance is going to come up. Now, what are you supposed to do when a hindrance comes up? 
we have this method of meditation called the six R's. You recognize when your mind is not on your object of meditation. You release the distraction. Now, what does that mean? It means that you don't keep your attention on whatever it is that's distracting you. You let it be there by itself. Then you relax the tightness caused by that. Then you bring up something wholesome. Smile. Then you direct your mind back to your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation for as long as you can. At first, it's difficult. But it will get easier as you smile more and you start uh, improving with your mindfulness. One of the questions that I was in Asia for 12 years and I went to many famous meditation teachers and I always asked the same question and I never really got an answer. And that is, what is craving? Now there's a lot of talk about craving and you have to let go of the craving if you want to attain Nibbana. But what is it? What is craving? Now you have five aggregates. You have a physical body. You have feeling. This is not emotion. This is just feeling. If it's a painful feeling, your mind says that's painful. If it's a pleasant feeling, your mind says that's pleasant. Or if it's a neutral feeling, your mind just doesn't much pay, pay much attention to it, to be quite honest. Okay, you have <clears throat> perception. Perception and feeling are always together, always. So if you have a pleasant feeling arise, your mind says that's pleasant. And this is where the start of your conceptual thinking is. You have thoughts and you have consciousness. Now, when, oh, well, let me go back and, and tell you all about craving. The craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. That's when we start taking things personally. And this is, this is a false belief. Why do hindrances arise? Why does craving arise? Because in the past, you broke a precept and you felt guilty about it. And that guilty feeling is the craving. I like it or I don't like it. This is me, this is mine. So, how do you recognize craving when it arises? That's the question, isn't it? Because we're supposed to, one, we're supposed to already know what craving is, but nobody ever gives us a good definition. So they tell you, well, it's desire. It's wanting something to be in a particular way. And that's a surface way of looking at it. But when you start seeing it's the I like it, I don't like it mind. And every time that arises, you have tension and tightness arising in your head, in your mind. Okay, so the way you recognize craving is by the tightness that's in your mind. How do you let go of craving? Relax. 
Let it be there by itself and just relax into it. Now, you, your brain is, is two parts like this, and you have a membrane that goes around your brain. It's called the meninges. It's just basically a bag that always stays the same size. But when craving arises, any kind of thought, any kind of feeling, any kind of sensation that arises, it causes your brain to expand a little bit against that membrane. And it causes tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. Now a lot of, I have a lot of uh, students that have practiced with uh, Goenka. And the hardest thing for me to do is to get people that have practiced with Goenka style meditation is stop trying to push and make mind be the way you want it to be. To stop trying to over focus. This is another advantage of the smile because it helps you to lighten your mind and that will help you be more aware of when it arises. So as soon as that distracting thought is noticed and you don't keep your attention on it, but you come to relax. As soon as you relax that tension and tightness, you're going to notice in your mind, your mind is very clear. Your mind is very bright and your mind is pure. Why is it pure? Because when you let go of that tension and tightness, you have let go of craving. And that's why your mind is pure. You don't have thoughts of me and my and I. So it's a real interesting phenomena that every time you have a thought, every time a sensation arises, I don't care if it's mental or physical, tightness occurs in your head. And you need to relax. If you notice it and you try to make it stop, you're putting wrong kind of energy in and it's going to cause so much more pain and suffering. So, you have to back off. Don't try so hard. Now on this retreat, there's three things I want to happen for you. One, I want you to smile. Now every time you see a Buddha image, he has a little smile on his face. Why? Because the artist is trying to show you that he has joy in his mind. So I want that to be for you too. I want you to laugh. Now I don't mean laugh out loud, but laugh with yourself when you get caught by a disturbance of some sort. Don't try to fight it, just laugh with it. What happens when you laugh is you go from, let's say there's anger in your mind at the time. I'm mad. I don't like it. I want it to stop. I, 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 I. That's taking it personally. And when you laugh, you go from taking this feeling personally, this is me, to 
it's only this feeling of anger. It's not mine. Did I sit and tell myself, you know, I haven't been mad for a while, I might as well be mad now, and then come up with a reason to be mad? No. What you have to do is laugh with it, and as soon as you laugh, you stop taking it personally. And do you want to carry anger around with you all day? No, you want to let it go. Just let it be there by itself. So it's a real necessary part of the practice to laugh a little bit. And I want you to have fun. Now I know you never hear that sort of thing with other meditation teachers, but it's a real necessary part of the practice. The more fun you have with the meditation, the faster you learn. It's like when you were in school, you had a favorite, a favorite class. What kind of grade did you get in that favorite class? Got a good grade, right? Why? Because it was fun. And you enjoyed it. That's what I want you to do with the meditation. And it will come. The more you smile, the more you'll see, the more fun it is. And you're going to you're going to learn more in this retreat than you've ever learned before. one of the things I want you to realize is that you are your own teacher. You're going to be able to recognize a hindrance and when you let it go and smile and come back to your object of meditation, you're teaching yourself how to purify your own mind. Hindrances, when they come up, are not your enemy. They're not something to fight with. It's just a distraction. And this is teaching you how to recognize that false belief in a personal self. And you're going to see that, well, it's just this thought, it's just this feeling, it's not mine. And you let it be very quickly and you relax into that and smile and come back. Now, the six R's, I don't want you saying each R in your mind and trying to make it be that way. Make it a flow. You don't have to tell yourself you're recognizing it when you have a distraction. You already know you're distracted. You don't have to say it. And then you keep your, uh, let your attention go and not keep your attention on what that distraction is and relax and smile and come back. Let it roll together. Okay? So this is a very uh, necessary part of the practice. Every time you use the six R's, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. There's a lot of people that talk about the Four Noble Truths and the and uh, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. What is the path leading to the cessation of suffering? It is the six R's. Okay. This will lead you all the way to Arahatship. So you want to be able to recognize as soon as you're 
as you can that you're distracted away from your object of meditation. Let it be, relax, smile, come back. Stay with your object of meditation for a long period of time, as long as you can. Don't hold on to your object of meditation and try to make it uh, stay with you. Huh, there went a deer. Bambi just walked by. So you don't fight with anything. You don't resist anything. You soften your mind. Smile. Bring that back to your object of meditation. So you don't resist, you don't push, you don't try to control. You just notice that your mind is distracted. Okay, fine. It's going to be like that for a while. And you'll get used to that. And you'll get used to being able to recognize it and don't make it a big deal. Don't make it some kind of major problem that you have to overcome and control. And that's kind of what Goenka students did, is they, they would focus on something and they would keep it in their attention and it would get bigger and more intent. And the, the, it became very painful. This meditation does not want, we don't want you to have pain. We want you to learn how to relax and let go of it. And how to have fun. Make everything part of a game. Don't be over serious with anything. Okay, keep your mind light. Don't criticize yourself because you're not going to be perfect with it. Okay? Now, another thing that I want you to, to understand is you're with your object of meditation. And there's thoughts that come up, but they don't pull your attention away from your object of meditation. Ignore those thoughts. They'll fade away by themselves without any problem. Only when your mind gets pulled away from your object of meditation, then you use the six R's to come back. Okay? I've had a lot of students come to me and they say, I ask how their meditation is uh, is going and they say, oh, it's a horrible day today. My mind was so active, I couldn't even use the six R's before my mind got distracted by something else. And you know what the solution to that is? You're not smiling enough. And why do I say that? because your mindfulness is such that you're getting involved with the hindrance and causing yourself a lot of pain. So, smile. Now you smile in your mind. You smile with your eyes, even when your eyes are closed, because sometimes you start squinting a little bit when you're trying. So just relax. Smile with your eyes. Little smile on your lips. A little smile, not a big toothy grin. And smile in your heart. Keep your heart soft. I don't care how many times your mind gets distracted. That doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with the distraction as soon as you recognize it. And that is, let the, let the distraction be by itself. 
Don't get caught up in thinking about stuff. Let it be. Relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. This is a real simple meditation. Now I spent 20 years with Vipassana meditation where I didn't learn very much of this stuff. And I went through a lot of suffering because of that. I want you to make life into a game. Don't be serious with anything. If you have repeat thoughts, you have craving in your mind. So don't criticize yourself because you got caught by it. Just recognize this. Well, that's part of your learning process. You are teaching yourself how to do this by repetition over and over and over again of using the six R's. And it's okay to do that. If you criticize yourself and tell yourself you just don't understand and I'm starting to get frustrated, who's getting frustrated? Who's not staying on their object of meditation? Who's causing themselves pain? You can't blame anybody out here for your pain. You cause it yourself. And you'll start to see that before long. Now, I'm used to people being very, uh, having very fast progress. And I am teaching a form of vipassana, but this is tranquil wisdom meditation. So what I want you to start realizing is that you don't have to always push yourself to get results that you want. Actually, you cause yourself a lot of pain when you do that. You will get a headache. Anytime there's tension here, there is craving here. So, what to do? Now, if you have a kind of hindrance that keeps coming up and, and there's all kinds of problems with that, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know what uh, the Buddha suggested. Now, he was traveling around, the Buddha was traveling around, and he, he, his uh, cousin was Anuruddha, who was, had just become a monk, and he'd, he'd been uh, trying real hard to follow what the Buddha was talking about. And he asked Anuruddha a question. While you were, while you abide thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, have you attained any super mundane states, a distinction of knowledge and vision worthy of noble ones, a comfortable abiding? What is a comfortable abiding? It is experiencing jhana. What is jhana? Jhana is a misunderstood word that's always thought to be concentration and one-pointed concentration. That is not the definition of jhana. The definition of jhana is a level of your understanding of how this process works. And 
When you get into a jhana, it is a superhuman state. It's not the way normal people think. Because you have more equanimity in your mind. And you have better understanding of how this process works than normal people. Normal people get real caught up in emotional nonsense. And it is nonsense. But as you continue on, you're going to teach yourself how that causes you pain because you're taking it personally and how to let it go by using the six R's. Venerable Sir, as we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute, we perceive both radiance of mind and the object of meditation. Soon afterwards, the radiance and the object of meditation disappear. But we have not discovered the cause for that. So they're talking about, at first the meditation can be very nice and peaceful, and then all of a sudden the hindrances come up. And they didn't. They haven't figured out how to how to let those go yet. And the Buddha said, "You should discover the cause for that, Anuruddha. Before my awakening, while I was still only an un unawakened bodhisattva, I too perceived both radiance and object of meditation." Soon afterwards, the radiance and object of meditation disappeared. Now this is the key. This is, you have to understand, the Buddha, when he was a, only a bodhisattva, he didn't have any teacher around. He didn't have anybody he could talk to about this. He had to figure it out for himself. So what he did was, he said, I thought, what is the cause and condition? Why the radiance and object of meditation have disappeared? He asked himself a question. Now, when you, when you have a hindrance and it's real hard to let go of, ask yourself, why is this happening? What am I doing that's causing this pain to arise? You're asking your intuition for the answer. And when you ask your intuition a question like that, you will get an answer. Then you can adjust your meditation and your meditation will mellow out and become quieter and easier. Then I considered thus. Doubt arose in me, and because of doubt, my collectedness fell away. When my collectedness fell away, the radiance and the object of meditation had disappeared. So, what this is saying is, when a hindrance pulls your attention away, and it doesn't go away, Ask yourself, why? What's the cause of this? You only ask one time, you go back to your, your meditation, the answer will come fairly quickly. Now I'll give you a for instance of that. I worked at a meditation center I was kind of the handyman kind of guy, fixing this and that. The place was falling apart from neglect, a lot of it. And somebody came and they wanted to do a meditation retreat, but the teacher came to me and said, he's going to be alone and I want him to sit with, I want you to sit with him so he won't be lonely, so he'll, he'll be able to go through the practice. 
So I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's why I'm here. I want to learn as much about meditation as I can. So yeah, okay, good. And I got restless. After a couple days of sitting, I, it, I was very restless. And I'm not prone to restlessness. I'm more prone to dull mind. For whatever reason. So I asked myself this question. I, and this, I, I was thinking myself, you know, this is really weird. I'm not prone to having a really restless mind. Why am I having it now? This is odd. So I went back to sitting and my intuition said, you're thinking about all the jobs you need to do when you get off retreat. And I was. And that's why my mind was restless. Because I was thinking about that, not staying on the object of meditation. So as soon as I recognized that, I went, yep, that's right. Now I'm going to stay with the the, whichever meditation I was doing, I think it was probably mindfulness of breathing at the time. And my mind just settled right down and I didn't have any problem with that for a period of time. I always had hindrances coming up. But the way I was taught to get rid of the hindrances was to suppress Note it until it goes away. Force my mind to stay on the object of meditation. And that was wrong effort. That was wrong energy. So I had problems with hindrances for years. Because I, I didn't have anybody explain to me how hindrances actually occur. Now the whole reason that we're here is because we have done hindrances in the past. It might be 500 years ago, it might be 20 minutes ago. But anytime we break a precept, we feel guilty. Even when you say something like a little white lie. You, your mind says, I shouldn't have said that. Very quietly, it'll say that. And then you're going to have restlessness coming up because of that, because of the guilty feeling. So if you have a big hindrance, and sometimes they can be quite strong, ask yourself why. Don't ask me why it's happening. I don't know you. You know? I mean, I know, I, I, I see you, I, I see your smiling, my, your smiling face, and that's great. But only you know what you're doing to cause yourself that suffering. So this is why you're going to be more and more aware of the necessity of keeping the precepts all the time. Now you've only got five precepts. I mean, that's a piece of cake. There's only five things. I have 227 of them. So I have to be much more careful with precepts. Anyway. Now, I want you to sit no less than 30 minutes. And when your sitting is good, sit longer. Okay? Anytime you get involved in a hindrance and you start thinking about it and trying to solve the problem and all of that, you are feeding that hindrance so it will get stronger and last longer and you're doing it to yourself. 
Now, the, the nature of this kind of practice is, I don't care what other kind of practice you've done, let it go. Don't add anything to this practice, don't subtract anything. Just simply follow the directions as I give them to you. And as the Buddha gives them to you, because you're going to be hearing more and more of this all the time. So it's a real important thing that you remember the six R's and use the six R's anytime there's a distraction. Don't criticize yourself. If you criticize yourself, guess who has craving in their mind? Guess who is causing themselves pain? So you don't do that. You be kind to yourself. You be gentle to yourself. Just because something doesn't work the way you think it should is no reason to criticize yourself. Okay? Just 6R and do it again. If a feeling doesn't go away after you've six hard and gone back to your object of meditation, your mind will go back to that again. Then you need to six hard it again in the same way. Everything that brings up wholesome mind has to do with letting go of craving. And that means noticing that slight tension and tightness in your body, in your mind. As soon as you let go of this tension here, your mind is going to become very bright and very alert. Then you have to bring up something wholesome. A smile. A joy. A laugh and bring that mind to your object of meditation. Now, oh, I've had some students that were Goenka students and after they did a retreat with me, they went to a Goenka retreat and they got kicked out of the retreat because they were told they can't smile while you're doing the meditation. Smiling helps your mind be more alert. Smiling helps your mind to be more uplifted and you're going to start feeling lighter and more joy as you do that more. So it's a real necessary part of the practice. And the more you lighten your mind, the more you're going to understand how this process actually does work. So turn it into a game that you play with. All life is supposed to be a game that you play with. I don't know who told us we're supposed to be serious and worry and anxiety and fear and all of these other nonsense things. We don't have to have those. The reason we have them is because in the past we broke precepts and this is the result. So what you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. If you fight with what's happening right now, if you really get in and try to control and make it stop and make it be the way you want it to be. You can look forward to having a lot of pain and it's going to keep coming back until you change. Now the thing with Buddhism that is real important that you need to understand is this is all about change. You hear, you hear the Buddha talk about 
everything is impermanent. Everything is in a state of change, and it is. But what you do with what arises in the present, if you use the six R's, your mind is going to understand more deeply how this process works. And you're going to be teaching yourself Buddhism. You won't notice it as, as that. We don't put a label on it, this is the Buddha. I, I use the Buddha as an example a lot, but I also explain what he's talking about, which is not something that you get. Um, I gave a, a talk to about a hundred uh, Mahayana monks, and I would say something. I was in uh, South Korea at the time, and I would say something, and the translator would say, that monk just said, well, that's Mahayana. So when I heard that, I stopped my talk and I said, I am not a Mahayana monk. I am not a Vajrayana monk. I am not a Theravada monk. I am a Buddhist monk. And they all got up and laughed and clapped. And being a Buddhist monk doesn't mean that I blindly believe anything that, the, that might be interpreted that the Buddha said. I don't. I'm going by my own experience. I'm not attached to being a Buddhist at all. And I've, I've been a monk for 35 years, and I'm not attached to it. So it's not like you're going to be uh, a Christian and say, well, it says in the Bible this and it says that. No, that's not what we're doing. We're teaching how mind works without dogma. I've had some some students that were Muslim and they were real afraid that I was going to teach them something and I, I said no I'm just teaching you how your mind works well when we get done with retreat can we still do our prayer prayers five times a day I said that's up to you I don't care that's fine you're in charge of your own happiness. You're in charge of your own pain. What I'm interested in showing you is how the process works so you can let go of the pain. And you can be more happy all the time. I have people that write to me after three or four years of doing a retreat and tell me how happy they still are. Well, they took it to heart. Great. Didn't say anything about the Buddha. Didn't mention it. And it's okay. So, <clears throat> getting back to some practical things about the retreat, I want you to Go to bed around 10 o'clock. Sleep until 5 o'clock. And get up and come into the meditation hall before 5.30 so you can do your chanting and, and uh, reciting of the precepts and taking the refuges and that sort of thing. Sit until breakfast time, which is seven o'clock. Go in and have your breakfast. Right after breakfast, take a half an hour or so and 
uh, brush your teeth and do, do personal things, whatever it is. We're going to give you some small jobs, but we want you to, one, be smiling all the time, and two, 6R, any time there is a distraction. I don't care what you're doing. This is an all-the-time practice. At 9 o'clock, I want you to come down to the gazebo down below, and then I will talk with each one of you individually. This is every day. Uh, lunch is going to be closer to 11.30. And then take an hour rest after that. If you want to lay down, lay down. If you want to sleep, sleep. It's up to you. And then there's walking and sitting until tea time, which should be six. six. Six o'clock. Don't talk. Uh, then there's going to be a Dhamma talk. And sometimes they last a long time, sometimes they don't. It depends on how wordy my mind gets. But when you're doing your walking, stay with your your object of meditation, whatever that happens to be. Now, there's some people that have uh, that are here that have taken retreat before, and their object of meditation is going to be different than yours if you're just starting out. But uh, I'm just going to talk about using your spiritual friend. Now, if you've been here before you know to do the six directions and don't do the individual people. So do you understand what a spiritual friend is? As someone of the same sex, they are alive and you have a lot of respect for them. You sincerely do wish them well. Stay with the same spiritual friend all the time. When you're walking, walk with your spiritual friend. Now, walking is a little more difficult at first than the sitting. Because you're used to walking and thinking this and thinking that and just generally distracting yourself. But when you see that's happening, don't make a big deal out of it. Just 6R and come back to your friend. Okay? And walk for 15 minutes or 20 minutes, something like that. But walk at a normal pace. I don't want you walking slowly. You're walking for two reasons. To develop your mindfulness more clearly while you're walking and to get exercise. As you sit, as you begin to sit longer, I might tell you to walk faster, or I'll tell you to run up and down stairs, or do something like that. So I don't want you walking super slow. There's no real advantage to doing that. The longer you sit, the more exercise you need. So you get more blood flowing, and that's a necessary part of the practice. But stay with your object of meditation while you're doing it, okay? Now, before you go to sleep at night, there's two things that I want you to do. The first is I want you to make a determination that you're going to wake up at exactly uh, the time you specify. Don't make it the same time every night. Don't just say, I, I want to wake up at five o'clock and try to hit that. 
but change it to 459 or 501, something like that, every night, make it a different time, and try to hit that. You probably won't very, very often, but that's okay. This kind of determination is very helpful later on in your practice, and it takes a while to be able to do it, so I get you started early. And the second thing I want you to do is make a determination to wake up smiling and happy. Wake up with a light mind. And the more you can do that, then keep it going for the rest of the day. Okay? So I want you to have fun. I want you to smile a lot. I want you to laugh. Odd meditation teacher, aren't I? <laughs> so do you have any questions? I want you to feel the wish for their happiness. Put them in the middle of the wish. Okay? But don't hang on to them too tight. Yeah? So are we imagining our friends smiling and things like that? No. You're feeling the happiness going to them. You put them in the middle of that feeling and we're just feel that. A lot of people teach loving-kindness where you have to visualize and it gets misunderstood a lot. People put way too much energy in trying to visualize and they wind up real sad. Knowing who you send that loving-kindness to is enough. Too many times people try to see them like they're in a picture or they have a very sharp memory of it, but it doesn't last very long. But knowing who you're sending it to, if you see them, fine. If you don't, fine. So you want about 70% of your attention on the feeling of radiating loving kindness. You want about 25% of your attention on making a wish, feeling the wish, and sending that wish to your friend. Only about 5% of your attention on trying to see your friend. That's why just saying their name can be enough of a visualization. It doesn't have to be very, it's not very important. You barely need to visualize your friend at all. Sometimes a, a picture of them that they did something and you laughed with them might come up. Okay, fine. But don't keep your attention on that. Keep your attention on the feeling of loving kindness in your heart, making a wish and feeling that wish and putting your friend right in the middle of that. That is the kind of visualization that I, that I like to teach. Okay? There are some forbidden words when you come and give, uh, talk to me about your meditation. One of the forbidden words is but. If you have a but, then you want to argue with me about it. I don't have time to argue. Get your butt out of the way. <laughs> and the other word is, I'm bored. No, who's bored? 
Who has a feeling come up and they don't like it and they try to make it stop? Who doesn't have any mindfulness at that time? Who's blocking themselves from going deeper? But I'm bored. Go through it. Six are it. Don't make it a big deal. It'll disappear very quickly when you do that. And as you go deeper, you're going to understand all of this stuff that I'm talking about today. You're going to understand it personally much more deeply because you are teaching yourself how your mind works. Okay? Anything else? Uh, for the third time. This is something that I recite at the end of every, re every uh, talk. So, you can read it out loud. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.